you know, like this can't be Christianity. But it did work that way. So monasticism had a great effect on Ireland, much so than the mainland. Now, we're going to talk about the mainland Europe when it caught on there. All right? Many such abbots are regarded in their lifetime as saints. And there are stories in which entire monasteries, each under their own saintly abbot, did battle with each other for one reason or another. <laughs> That's holy wars, folks. Not too holy, though. All right. So, how are we doing? We got it done. Next one here. Let's go here. So, a monk starts a monastery off the coast of southern France. Men come there and go out preaching the gospel. Patrick goes to Ireland, has a tremendous effect, and brings monasticism with to Ireland. So, let's see what happens here. Uh, there, the Irish now begin to evangelize. Here's what they would do. They board on flimsy leather and wicker boats that they used, were used by the Irish, pushed out to sea, go wherever the current took them. One place they landed was the island of Iona, off the western coast of Scotland, where they founded and became famous with an influential monastery. The monks of Iona soon managed to convert southern Scotland and northern England to Christianity. So we're seeing, you know, this. <laughs> God did use this. Like I said, the church in many ways had lost its way. But these monks were devout, and they were zealous, and they wanted people to believe. And they went out, and they preached, and Christianity was spread by them. Now, there were some good things that happened in monasteries, some terrible things that happened, if you read the history of them. Uh, but, you know, it was, if you will, it was the best the church had. Let's put it that way. When the Catholic Church lost its way and wanted to reform itself, it went to the monks for leadership. And that's one of the reasons why Catholic priests are celibate today. Because in reforming itself, the monks said, hey, if you're going to be spiritual, be celibate, like us. The church said, okay. <laughs> this was, you know, how this was affecting them. And this is why what the monks did became what the church did. Penance is a real big thing in Catholicism, even more so in the Middle Ages. You did penance, and, and they were taught to do penance and enforced humility in monasteries. And, you know, it went up. So, what else are we going to look at here? Yeah. Uh, Benedict. Saint Benedict. He is, and look at the year here, 480 to 543. He finds a form of monasticism that appeals to the Europeans on the European continent. Before we mentioned, in the east, then to southern France, a monastery, then those monks going out preaching in the Isles, the, you know, Ireland, Scotland, England. But it was St. Benedict, or Benedict, and he had a, you know, people have their own personalities, their own looks, so he had a, a, a little different <coughs> take on the monastic world. Here it is. Before he becomes a monk, he studied law, then adopted the, the monastic life, and he defined his monastery as a corporation. <laughs> I'm going to run it like a business. More to the point, however, he emphasized obedience and discipline, regular and congregate meals, a moderate life divided equally between work, sleep, prayer, and standard dress to be drawn from the common store. The monk was supposed to dress in very common, plain clothes a series of special offices to regulate the communal life, and a number of other similar things. Now, here's where it gets interesting. We're indebted to him for some things. His monastery was to be much like an army unit, and he freely used military terminology in writing the rule. He referred to the monks as schola, a word which we derive from school. That's where our school comes from. You've had a schoolmaster like that before, some of you, right? Discipline. Yes, anyway. Regularity, moderation, and above all, discipline appeal to the people of the West. And the military ideal was one that attracted them. So, the discipline of the thing attracted them. By the way, people join the Army and Navy today because of the discipline that is instilled in them. It's considered one of their merits. 
Some of you have met someone after they got out of the service, you have to tell them they're not in the Army anymore. But, uh, you know, but uh, there's, there's something to it. Benedict's form of monastery slowly began to spread and eventually became the standard. Yeah. So, instead of being athletes for Christ, they are soldiers for Christ. That was the terminology used. And how does this affect us today? I'm going to show you this. This gets interesting. Here. The Benedict rule had an ever greater importance for Western attitudes and values. It stated that the abbot, he's in charge of the monastery, was in complete control of the monastery, but he had to consult with the entire body of monks on all important matters. This is foundational for a thing we call democracy, representative democracy. So we remember in American history the town meeting, right? Everyone in the town met, everybody spoke their piece, but once they made a law, you all have to live by it. Where did that come from? It came from Benedictine monasteries. That's where it was first practiced in Europe. It's the idea. Everybody has a vote, but you're not the leader. But the leader has to consult people. You make a decision, and then it's binding. These are the roots of democracy, the roots of a representative republic. So, the abbot complete control, but he had to consult with the entire body of monks on all important matters, take responsibility for the decision, and he, he, the leader, had to observe the regulations just like everyone else. You know, the king could do what he wanted, right? But everybody else had to follow the rules? No go. <laughs> Gotta live by the rules like everybody else. In addition, it required the congregation to read and discuss the rule chapter by chapter, beginning over again once they had completed. So on a regular basis, they read the rule book. And everybody agreed to the rule book, and the abbot enforced it. This is the, uh, this is the beginning of what we would call constitutional government. The United States is founded on a constitution. And we live and abide by the rules of that constitution. They did this in a monastic setting, but the monks set the tone for the rest of society. This was the ideal. This is how they did it right in a monastery. So when you look at the roots for democracy, you know, this is one of the places. Now, it gets better here. Watch what they did in these monasteries. Uh, the rule was, therefore, a written constitution something that the founders of the United States felt was a great step forward for individual liberty, in which the subjects of Great Britain even now do not possess. Interesting. Okay. Watch this thing. Then, too, all the monks were equal in status. This is not a normal idea in the Roman Empire or medieval life. You know, the blue bloods and the royal bloods? And we're better blood than you, and so we marry royalty because the royalty, of course, are better than these poor peasants. No, 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 no. You get to the monastery, you walk in the door, everybody is what, folks? Equal. Equal. This is a revolutionary idea. Where do we get that from? The scriptures? The scriptures. There's no, there's no male or female. There's no Jew or Gentile. We're all one and equal in Christ. Okay? So Christians looked at that scriptures and it was a basis and understanding for, for democracy. So there were neither nobles or commoners in a Benedictine monastery. If you were dirt poor and you passed through those doors, you had the same rights and privileges as a man who left the kingdom behind him. So they called it being born again. When you're in the monastery, we're now all equal. This is your new life. All right? All men are created what, folks? Equal. Where do we get that from? Part of the idea came from the Benedictine monks in the Middle Ages. So, though, you know, I, I'm not a big endorser of monastic life. Some good things, some good ideas came out of monasticism and some real evangelism and, and real life-changing evangelism and some miracles. Patrick was, there were miracles associated with his, uh, you know, winning the island of Christ. God was with him in this thing. So, when they passed through the door of the monastery 
They were born again into the monastic life. They were born equal. This was a revolutionary idea in 1776 when it was written into the American Declaration of Independence. Interesting history. <laughs> One of the lessons of history is that God is sovereign over all things. And his purposes will prevail. So he uses. The church becomes part of the political structure, becomes corrupt. So what do people who are devout do? We'll get out of the world. We'll get away from the world. And this is how they did it. Now, different times of monastic life also became corrupt. Different monasteries that started good, some of them went bad, and there was all kinds of corruption going on. And others had to be started. It wasn't that the Benedictines were always good and holy and true. But there were real monasteries, real godly men, there was real prayer going on, and there was real evangelism going on. We thank God for that. All right. You're out of here early tonight. God bless you. One more class before our Christmas break. Thanks, Rob. Amen?